Praise the Lord. Welcome to class, all of you online students. Also, welcome to our in-person students and to all of uh, our e-learning students who will be listening to the lecture later on. Uh, we'll continue our study on a chapter um, seven. Okay, before we move on to chapter eight, and I'll ask one of our in-person students to lead us in prayer, please. <clears throat> Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, my Lord. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for us giving a new month in our lives, my Lord. Thank you for this hour of study, my Lord. Give our wisdom of understanding how to understand the word of God, my Lord. I'm blessing everybody's life, surrounding everybody's life in your hands. In Jesus' name I pray and ask. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So we were studying uh, chapter 7. We had looking at it for quite a number of uh, uh, classes now, very important um, lesson. And um, last last class on Tuesday, something wrong? Okay. Uh, we were, we continue our study on chapter seven about what was the purpose of incarnation, okay? Why did Christ have to become a man and take on the fullness of humanity and what was Christ doing through the humanity of Christ that he could not do through any other means. So we're looking at, we looked at various scripture passages that talks about the humanity of Jesus Christ and why he had to become human and what are the things he fulfilled in the flesh. So we looked at the threefold purpose of um, Jesus partaking in the flesh and blood in Hebrews chapter Remember which passage? Yes, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. Okay, so we looked at the threefold purpose there. Jesus shared in our humanity. Why did he share in our humanity? Threefold things that we learned in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. The first one is, okay, thank you, to destroy the power of death. The second one is, To bring deliverance, yes, thank you. And then the third one is, what is the third one? Huh? To become uh, to become our uh, high priest to make atonement for the sins of the people. Okay, so these are the threefold purpose of um, of Christ's humanity that we saw in Hebrews chapter uh, Hebrews chapter. 2 verses 14 to 18, okay? And then we looked at Galatians chapter 4 verses 4 to 7 where we looked at uh, that Jesus came to redeem us from, uh, from the curse of the law, okay? So we, when we look at he, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28 and Deuteronomy chapter 30, there God lists out all the blessings and all the curses for those who keep the law. So if you look and study Deuteronomy chapter 28 or if you look at uh, and, and read Deuteronomy chapter 30, you will see a list of blessings and curses. Okay. So the Israelites uh, knew that if they did not keep the law, then they would inherit curses. Okay. And so they were very rigid in keeping, um, uh, uh, they couldn't keep the law. They found it difficult to keep the law, okay, but they held on to the law and the law helped them to know when they have sinned and gone against God uh, so that they, and when they did that, they used to go to the temple and make uh, sacrifices, okay. But when Jesus came and died on the cross, he redeemed us from the curse of the law. Okay, he redeemed us from the curse of the law, or he redeemed us from being under the law. Why did he redeem? Uh, how did he redeem us from being under the law? He died on the cross. When he died on the cross, he redeemed us from being under the law. And what does it mean to be under the law? Okay, we studied Galatians chapter uh, 4, verses 4 to 7 where we looked at how in the fullness of time God sent his son who was born 
under the law to redeem those who are under the law okay so what does it mean that jesus came to uh, to abolish the law the law was not good the law was not perfect so he came to set us free from the law he came he came to uphold the law yes we uh, also looked at romans chapter 7 verse 7 verse 12 verse 14 where it says the law is good the law is just and holy the law is spiritual okay romans chapter 7 verse 14 and uh, it was given by god and we also saw that the law served a purpose it served a reason a purpose and that was pointing people to the sin that they committed and also the law was pointing to jesus okay that is very very important the law made us aware of this of sin that we have sinned we are sinning uh, we are sinners we have missed the mark but it more um, uh, you know uh, beautifully was pointing out to jesus christ okay why was it pointing out to jesus christ why was the law pointing out to jesus christ He was a perfect uh, uh, person to uphold the law. Perfect, as in uh, where he uh, without any sin. So there was nobody else better than him to hold the law. Okay, even though he was fully man, he was able to keep the law. Okay, and he continued to remain sinless. Okay, so he uphold the law, like he said. And also he was someone who came to redeem us from the curse of the law. Okay. And so that is why we looked at Galatians chapter 4. We studied Galatians chapter 4 uh, in detail. Uh, or we looked at the book of Galatians and we looked at the book of uh, Romans. So what Paul is basically saying is uh, in Galatians, he's telling the Jews or the Judaizers, Judaizers who were becoming would become Christians, who come into the Christian faith, that there is that you are saved by grace through faith. It's not by keeping the law, okay? Because when they became believers in Christ, they were part of the church, they were forcing the others to keep the um, righteous requirements of the law, the rituals, the the circumcision rituals, or make all this, you know, keep all those special days and feasts. And so they were burdening the Gentiles with the rituals and the traditions of the law. So Paul is saying, hey, you know, Christ has come to set us free, you know, from being slaves of um, the law. He set us free. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. It says he set free those who are under the law, uh, free from its bondage and bringing us out of slavery, okay, into the glorious liberty to be sons and daughters, okay. And in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, he says, you know, that uh, he has set us free and hence we no longer need to live under the law of the flesh. That means under the dominance of the flesh. So what Paul is basically saying is, hey, God set us free uh, and he wants his people free and not be bound to all the rituals and traditions. And he's also telling in Galatians chapter three, uh, 5 verse 1, stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled with the yoke of bondage. Okay. And um, in verse 13, he says, you know, you have been set free you have been given liberty and freedom don't use that liberty and freedom to indulge in the desires of the flesh okay so he's saying the law of flesh that means the law means not the old testament law but the law of flesh here means the dominance the power of the flesh the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the overpowering nature of the flesh to yield to sin okay so he's saying don't be under that bondage, okay? Because you have been set free and don't use your freedom, the grace that you have received to continue to live under the bondage of the flesh, okay? And he also, uh, Paul is basically talking about uh, 
how we are out of the curse of the law or we are redeemed from the law in the terms of what he was experiencing himself. Now we know that before Paul became a, a believer, he was a He's a Jew, right? He was somebody who upheld the law. He was very zealous for his for the law, he, to keep the law. Um, and he was a very zealous believer of the Old Testament. And anyone who went against that, he was that's why he was persecuting all the those who were believing in Christ and putting them into uh, prison. Okay. So he thought, Paul thought that as a Jew who was keeping the law, he was very blameless before God. He was very righteous. He was right. He was blameless uh, by the mere outward obedience and the outward, uh, you know, following of the ceremony, ceremonies and the rituals and the traditions of keeping the law. But he, he realized later on when he became a believer that all of it was just an outward um, outward obedience but inwardly he was so far away from God. Why? Because through this in his heart he was very very proud. Okay? He was proud that he was a blameless person, a blameless Jew was keeping the law, very zealous for his uh, for his um, uh, you know, for the law, for uh, the uh, the commandments, uh, you know, uh, very zealous for keeping his uh, his uh, his religion and holding it up and upholding uh, upholding it against everything that is coming against it. And he thought in his heart that was kind of a pride, a pride of being blameless, a blameless uh, obedience. Also, he realized that actually that was sinning against God. Pride was sinning against uh, God. So that is why he says when he writes in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 15, he says, you know, I'm actually the chief of sinners, you know, but by God's grace, I have been saved. But I am the chief of sinners. Why does he say that? Because he's saying, hey, you know, I thought I was very blameless, righteous before God because I was keeping the law. I was fighting for my religion. But deep down, I realized later on that I was having this pride. And that is why Jesus, you know, he confronts the Pharisees and he calls them what? Tombs that are white, whitewashed stones, tombs, right? Because it looks very beautiful on the outside, but inside... In the spirit, they're totally dead. Okay, there is no love, there is no compassion, there is no forgiveness, and so Jesus was outrightly condemning their keeping of traditions and rituals because the Pharisees they would go stand in the in the uh, you know the end of the road and they would just uh, pray and they would go to the temple they would just pray out loud they would. Uh, you know, dress up with all of those tassels, everything which had the word of God, you know, tied around their heads and everything. So everything, they were very, very uh, ardent in keeping the law. But they failed to love their neighbor as themselves. They failed to love God with all of their heart, soul, mind and strength. Okay. And they looked down on others who were not able to keep the law. But they themselves were breaking the law in so many different places and that is why Jesus was confronting them. So that is what Paul is again talking about in his epistles and he's saying hey you know no need to keep or you know it's not the law that has saved you because the law could never save you you know the law continually showed you that you were sinning and you were making more sacrifices and Jesus came to deliver us from that bondage that slavery and redeemed us from the curse of the law so it is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ that you are saved. Not by these empty keeping of rituals and ceremonies. Okay. So if you didn't understand anything that I said in the last class about Galatians chapter 4 and what Paul was talking about the law, just understand that, you know, we are saved by grace through faith and it's not by rituals and traditions Okay, sometimes we think it's our works that, you know, uh, uh, that saves us. It's our works that is going to bring blessings from God. But God, what does God say? Obedience is better than 
sacrifice okay so paul also realized that obedience is more than just keeping all these uh, traditions and these laws okay so that is what paul is saying and he is saying that christ came to redeem us from the curse of the law or he came to redeem us from the law any questions any doubts Okay, so no questions and doubts. We'll move on to the last bit of this um, uh, lesson where it's talking about divine exchange. So can somebody please read 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, please? For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes, your sakes, he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Amen. So we were... We studied in great deal, uh, you know, uh, we looked at what is the purpose of incarnation, what did Christ achieve or fulfill by becoming fully uh, man. And uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9 actually, uh, you know, sums up the whole purpose of incarnation in just one verse. Okay, it says Christ became poor for our sake so that we through his poverty or we through his incarnation could become rich which means that you know christ took everything that was ours and in exchange he gave everything that was his to us okay so what is the divine exchange that took place on the cross the first thing is can somebody read that please is there in your notes Is there in your notes in the divine exchange? Can somebody read that? Need to use the mic. To lift us to his level. Can you read that please again? Christ came to our level to lift us to his level at the right hand of God. Yes, so Christ came. He, he limited himself to our level so that we can be raised up to his level. Where are we seated now? Yes, we're seated in the heavenly place, the right hand of God, yeah, the yeah. of authority. Okay. What is the second divine exchange? Can somebody else read that? Christ became what we were so that we could become what he is. First John 4 17. Yes, can somebody read what first John 4 17 says, please? Anyone? First John 4 17. First John chapter 4 verse 17 Love has been perfected among us in this that we, we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is so are we in this world As he is so are we okay so Christ became what we were what did Christ become it Says Christ became what we were that means What did Christ become as we were? Human, human being. Okay, human. And what yeah. else did he did on the what else on the cross did he take on? He took on the sins of mankind. Okay. So he took on our sins. He became like us so that we can become like him. Okay, so when um, uh, when Paul says in um, in Romans chapter six, he talks about our spiritual identification. Okay, he says that we are, you know, just like Christ, we are also dead with Him. Okay, we are crucified, we are dead, we are buried, we are resurrected, we are ascended, and we're seated at the right hand of the Father. So we we identify with Christ spiritually so he when he says when we identify with christ's death that means we just like you know a dead person is when he's dead he's separated from the things of the world it means that we are separated from sin from the power of sin we no longer have the power of sin reigning in us and it talks about we identify with christ's resurrection means now we have the new nature of christ 
okay so we are no longer we are separated from the things of this world we no longer have the nature of sin we are separated from the power of sin from the bondage of sin we are dead to sin um we're separated from our past sinful life and now we have the nature of god in us okay so that is who we have become and that is what the holy spirit is doing in us he is making us more christ like okay so we have the nature of christ in us just like when god created us created adam and eve Eve, he created them in his image okay in his nature so also when we uh, have received salvation we now have the nature of christ okay we no longer belong to the adam race but we are part of christ's nature we belong to the family of god that is why we are sons and daughters of god okay what is the third divine exchange can somebody read that please Christ became... Shall I go ahead, sir? Yes, go ahead. Sorry, Sister Lucy. Christ became our sin so that we could become his righteousness. Yes, Christ became sin for us so that we, uh, when he took on our sin, he gave us his righteousness. His righteousness was imputed upon us. Or oh, we were clothed with his righteousness. Imputed means his righteousness was put into our account. Okay. What is the fourth one? Can somebody read the fourth divine exchange? Christ was crucified on the cross so that we could be blessed with all spiritual blessings. Amen. Christ was cursed on the cross. He took upon himself our curse, our shame, you know our guilt okay so that we can receive all of the spiritual blessings all of the spiritual blessings that we read in ephesians one okay all of the spiritual blessings is ours yes can you please uh yeah uh, can you just throw some light on spiritual blessings because is it something just uh, again in sync with the, the gifts of the spirit or the uh, fruits of the Holy Spirit. Or what is exactly spiritual blessings? Okay, what exactly is your spiritual blessings? Because here in the verse also, it just says spiritual blessings okay. in the heavenly places in Christ. But uh, what are what is it like referring? What is the spirit? Okay, that spiritual blessings um, is when we are seated at the right hand of God, that we are seated in a place of dominion and authority okay and we 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 know our do, uh, dominion and authority that has been given to us we know who we are in christ we know our position and we speak and we look at things in uh, uh, on earth not in the earthly perspective not with an earthly frame of mind but we look at it in a heavenly perspective because we are seated in the heavenly realm so we are looking down at things so our position is now up and we're looking down at things. That means we are, you know, in a place of authority and power and we need to look at our the, uh, the our uh, environment, our, the, the sphere that God has given to us, not in an earthly mindset, in an earthly perspective, but in a heavenly perspective. Okay. So, uh, and also we are in a place of, when you see the right hand of God, right hand basically means place of authority. Okay, place of dominion and power. So we know our authority and dominion and power and how we need to exercise that over our situations and over Satan and everything that comes against us. Okay, so that is again a spiritual blessings. But what are the spiritual blessings that we have inherited? What is the, when we receive salvation, what is the first spiritual blessing that we inherit? Come on, what are spiritual blessings that you have inherited? Holy Spirit, okay. Salvation, right. Eternal life, okay. You are no longer going to be dead eternally, but you are also going to receive eternal life, okay. Uh, what else? What is your spiritual blessings? Righteousness, okay, that you may have right standing with God. So what does that mean when you have right standing with God? 
no more god looks at you as though you have sinned but he looks as you just looks at, at you just as if you have never sinned okay what else sorry obedient to god okay okay we are sons and daughters of god thank you lucy yes we are adopted into god's family we become god's uh, children we have the nature of god running in us or in us what else uh, sister we have redemption of sins and forgiveness yes we have the redemption we redeem from sin from the slavery of sin bondage of sin slavery of death uh redemption basically means what redemption means for in the greek it basically means one of the greek words for redemption means purchase out of the slavery purchase out of slave market okay uh jesus is a great blessing for us okay what else god becomes our father yes what else is your spiritual blessing Sister, you have given us the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay, gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Look at Ephesians chapter one. What does Ephesians chapter one say? Can I read, sister? Sorry, no, no, no. Can no. I read? It? No, don't read. Just look at and. and just call out what are the spiritual blessings you have also have access to god the father right you can come before the throne of grace you have access before god the father you have uh, the spiritual authority over satan and his demonic forces okay what else redemption, redemption and forgiveness of sins what else accepted and beloved yes you have the hope of the future glory and the assurance of salvation yes what else what else is your spiritual blessings ha bhagwan se bahut sare the in him we also obtain an inheritance we free this time of the yes your inheritance is your spiritual blessings yes you have not inherited fear you have not inherited poverty you have not inherited uh, you have freedom from every uh, bondage deliverance from every bondage from sickness healing okay uh, from suffering from pain uh, you have the hope and uh, encouragement that god is your provider he is the one who sustains you okay so all of these are your spiritual blessings okay yes the hope and a future yes okay only today i think uh, andrew and lucy are attending the online classes we don't have anyone else sharing anything on the chat or even talking okay okay we'll move on so um, can somebody read the next um, exchange the divine exchange we read christ was cursed on the cross that we can be blessed with all spiritual blessings what else christ became sick with our sickness so that by his stripes we could be healed yes he took upon our sicknesses our infirmities he took upon himself our suffering our pain uh, so that we can be healed delivered and uh, uh, restored to wholeness the next divine exchange can somebody else read that Christ became the son of man so that we become the children of God. Yes, he became like us so that we can become the children of God. Next one, yes, go ahead, read, 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 read. Give it to him. Uh, please read. Yeah. Christ was born in subjection. Christ was uh, born in subject uh, subjection to the law so that uh, those under the law could. could be remained could be redeemed, redeemed yes so he christ subjected himself to the laws that he could redeem us from the law next one christ came to the earth to tell us about the father then he went to heaven 
to tell the father about us yes so he came to the earth to reveal the father to us and now he is gone to uh, he is in heaven and what what does it mean when by when it says here he went to heaven to tell us about the father means what what does it mean he went to heaven to that means he is the mediator sister yes thank you sister getrude thank you for even contributing the class so uh, this only sister get through lucy and andrew here today praise god for them okay he's uh, interceding for us he's our advocate okay uh, who's um, you know interceding who's um, who's talking on behalf of us to the father the next one can somebody from the online students read the next divine exchange in your notes the incarnation god taking on human form is god coming down to be with man the resurrection is man being raised to be with the father amen so here we see that in the incarnation god took on human form he came down he revealed uh, the father heart of god to us and in the resurrection you know um, man is being raised or you know we have this hope of eternal life that when we die we are resurrected and we are going to live eternally with god the father okay the last one divine exchange can somebody read christ was separated from the father so that we who were enemies could be reconciled to god yes so on the cross when jesus took on the sins of the world he was separated from the father he went through that pain that suffering uh, of being separated from the father so that we who were enemies of god we who were separated from god could be reconciled back to god that means we could be reunited we can become friends with god again okay so we looked at all of this we studied all of this we looked at various scripture passages uh, uh, in this chapter on incarnation and this is the beautiful divine exchange that took place on the cross so when somebody asks you hey why did jesus die on the cross your answer will not be limited to only one line jesus died on the cross to take on our sins but now you have so much more to tell them why jesus took on human form why he died on our cross yes or no yes okay so that was a divine exchange and that uh, we also saw in this lesson uh, the purpose of incarnation okay why did god have to take on the fullness of humanity any questions any questions any doubts anything you all didn't understand that you want me to explain again okay i'll take the silence as a no and we'll move on okay um the lesson 8 uh, the virginal conception okay now why have we named this chapter as the virginal conception why couldn't we just have made it simple for all of you just say the virgin birth any thoughts all of you put on your thinking hats and start thinking and ask the holy spirit to reveal some some truths why is the chapter named as the virginal conception and not as the virgin birth we have to use the mic please yeah it was uh, very much in the plan of god it didn't happen something like a default thing in the process it was very much prophesized uh, much earlier so it was, was prophesied much earlier the virgin uh, giving birth to okay the virgin right? giving birth uh, okay you're right so it is uh, somewhere it was there in the concept of god you know you can't um, save yourselves from sins with human flesh and the law and uh, so on and so forth so it is my uh, idea to give my son as a sacrifice so it was there in god's mind much earlier as in it was prophesized and it had to come to pass so it was not something that it happened in the process okay so why can't we just name this chapter as the virgin birth why are we saying the virginal conception 
Sister, because it was through the Holy Spirit and not a man. This is the Holy Spirit, not a man. Okay, Pratt says because Jesus was conceived by the power of the Most High. Yes. Sanjay says from the notes, there has been much controversy concerning the virginal conception of Christ. The term virginal conception is preferable <laughs> rather than the most common. Okay, he's just uh, quoting from the from the notes. Okay, I I I thought you would say something that would come up with your mind. Anyway, thank you, Sanjay. But yes, Pratt, what you said is uh, so right because Jesus was conceived by the power of the Most High. The miracle was not in the birth, right? Why do I say the miracle was not in the birth, but the miracle was in the conception? Why did I? Why do I say that the miracle was not in the birth, but in the conception? Because the birth was birth, birth was a natural process of after conception, but it was the conception which was miraculous. It was where God uh entered uh through the power of the holy spirit uh entered uh mary yes you're right warren so if the miracle did not happen in the birth the miracle was a normal process right mary went through the nine months of pregnancy and she gave birth in a very natural way but which all women do okay but the miracle was in the virginal conception the conception means that through the power of the holy spirit uh, mary was able to conceive jesus was able to have jesus in uh, in the womb okay so it was the miracle happened not in the birth but in the conception and that is why we have um, you know uh, termed or named this lesson as the virginal conception okay um because it's not in the birth but in the conception okay so um now there is much controversy concerning the virginal conception of uh, jesus christ even his birth many people don't um, accept it many people don't uh, agree to it or uh, you know accept it or even give into it okay because uh, one of the things that they try to argue from is isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 so can somebody read isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 please isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 therefore the lord himself will give you a sign behold the virgin shall conceive and be a, a son and shall call his name emmanuel amen so the hebrew word here for virgin is alma which when it's translated can mean two things it can mean young woman or virgin so it can mean a virgin or it can also mean a young woman who is married a young woman is not specifically talking about a virgin it can be somebody who's also married and is young a young woman so that is why people who support the claim that you know um, that support this stand that jesus did not have a supernatural uh, or mary did not have a supernatural conception and jesus was you know, born uh, not out of supernatural conception or through the conception of the holy spirit okay is because they use this um, uh, this uh, verse in isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 and translate because the word alma says Either it's young woman or virgin, but thank God, you know, um, God in His wisdom knows uh, man's thoughts and man's ways and man's ways of thinking. So through the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, when Matthew and Luke write their gospel accounts and they talk about the virgin birth, the Greek the word they use for virgin is patinios. Okay. So Parthenios means just virgin. It does not mean a young woman. It does not talk about a woman or a young woman. The word Parthenios just means virgin. Okay. So we can argue from the standpoint that, hey, it was not a, just a young woman. So any woman was married, but it was specifically a virgin. 
Okay, so the virgin virginal conception of Christ, you know, has to be looked on because it is a fact that it was through the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit that brought it about. Okay, and we read this in uh, Luke chapter one verses twenty six to thirty. Eight. So, can somebody read that, please? Luke chapter one, verse twenty-six to thirty-eight. Luke chapter one, twenty-six to uh, thirty-eight. In the sixth month of uh, Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, "Greetings, you are highly favored." The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly, greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of, the father, of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How how will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Amen. Even uh, Elizabeth. Uh, stop there, Warden. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so here we see that you know uh, the virginal conception. You know, uh, is cannot be proved scientifically. Okay, it is uh, not scientific. It goes against all of natural laws, but you know, it is not something that is impossible with God. Even though it cannot be proven scientifically, it's unscientific. It goes against or violates all of the natural laws, but nothing is impossible with God. When God can create man out of dust there's nothing that he can't do when god can create everything just through his spoken word there's nothing that he can't do so it was not difficult for him to bring about this whole virginal conception because even when uh, when uh, the um, angel gabriel is speaking to mary in verse 37 he says for with god nothing is impossible it says, you know, your Elizabeth, Elizabeth, your relative is also conceived a son in the old age, you know, and she's now in a sixth month. And then verse 37 says, with God, nothing is impossible. So, yes, it can seem an impossibility in our in our small minds. OK, but in the mind of God, nothing is impossible. And hen hence, virginal conception was not an impossibility with God it was something that he brought about and how did he bring it about he brought it about by the power of the holy spirit okay and uh, it says here in verse 35 the holy spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you therefore also that the holy one who is to be born will be called the son of god that means the one that is going to be born will be holy okay that's something that we need to keep in uh, mind okay so we look at the doctrinal importance of the virgin birth uh, we look at it, it uh, uh, that can be seen at least in two areas the first thing why did god bring about this virginal conception okay why couldn't he have done it in any other way okay uh, he why did he bring about birth of jesus through the virgin's conception is because he wanted to show us that salvation must come from God. Okay, just as he had promised in the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Remember, remember we studied Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. What does it talk about in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15? The seed of the woman will ultimately destroy the serpent. Okay, so the seed of the woman, who is the seed referred to here? Jesus. Also, it's talking about we as a human race, but specifically talking also about Jesus. Jesus, you know, who destroyed the serpent. Okay, and so God was saying that the power 
that salvation will be brought about by his own power and not through human effort okay so the virgin birth of jesus christ is a reminder to us that salvation can never come through human effort but salvation is always the work of god himself so salvation is through the supernatural work of god and it is very evident from the very beginning you know of jesus his conception in the in mary's womb look at we already looked at galatians chapter 4 verses 4 and 5 says god sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those who were under the laws that we might receive adoption as sons okay okay so uh, that is the first doctrinal importance the second doctrinal importance about the virgin birth made possible uh, the uniting of deity and humanity in the one person of jesus christ okay so in in jesus we see the there's perfect unity of humanity and divinity, okay? Perfectly united in the person of Jesus Christ, okay? So if this unity had to be existed uh, in perfect unity, in perfect oneness, then only the virgin birth or virgin conception could make it possible, okay? So it was only through this means that God could, uh, you know, um, let Jesus be born into this world or God could send his son into this world as a man, okay? So we can think of other possible ways when uh, how God could have brought Jesus into this earth, but none of them would be sufficient enough to, you know, perfectly unite uh, humanity and deity in the person of Jesus christ okay so uh, for example you know it could be very hard if we uh, for humanity and deity to exist in perfect unity if we think that you know what if jesus you know came into this world with both father and mother okay he had fully divine nature okay he was born as a perfect human being with the uniting of a father and mother and sometime later on you know um, you know he could god could have put somewhere when he was on this earth his deity into him himself okay or he could have put deity into jesus christ you know when we when we think of this possibility what is wrong in that or what could have gone wrong in that what if we say that what if Jesus was born in this world with both a father and mother, okay, with his full divine nature united in his human nature at some point earlier, early in his life, then what do you think would have been difficult for us to understand? Well, didn't understand my question. Okay, what I'm saying is, if this possibility comes in our mind, what if Jesus was born in a perfect human way with, you know, a father and mother? And sometime when he after was born during his very early life, you know, what if God would have miraculously united his, you know, divine nature into his human nature? It also says you can't be born of sin, no? Yes, right. So when we say that, you know, he was born the, in the right, perfect way, just like any other human being, then we are, we are saying that, hey, he was born just like us. His origins were just like us, which means we're all born in sin. So he was also born in sin. Then if he is born in sin, how can he take on the, how can he be sinless to take on the sins of human nature? And how can divinity exist in a human being who was sinful which is very very impossible okay so we'll stop here okay uh, any questions uh, yeah.
conception and uh, incarnation can't stand or fall together sorry the two events stand or fall together so what's it referring to on the notes virginal conception and the incarnation are interdependent the virginal conception and the incarnation are interdependent two events stand or fall to together. together that means virginal conception means an incarnation god becoming man is was perfect it's perfect when we think about it in terms of virginal conception because he was not born like you said like to human parents and he was born in sin but virginal conception made it possible for humanity and divinity to perfectly coexist in the person of jesus christ oh two events stand together but if they are not together then they will fall apart okay if it if we say jesus was god becoming man and it was not through virginal in, uh, conception then it will fall apart there is no ways we can really uh, yes not understood no way that we can debate or talk about it okay we'll stop here um, andrew can i answer your question andrew and sanjay can i answer your question next week please is that all right because i have to go for my next class is that fine okay Okay, thank you everyone. I'll just copy and paste this so that I can answer it. Have a blessed weekend everyone. See you all on Tuesday. Thank you, sister. Thank you. Bye-bye.